Bullshit. Pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe free of bullshit and full of bold solutions. That's what the No BS Show is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Chris Rodell, the author of four books, including Use All the Crayons, The Colorful Guide to Simple Human Happiness. But first, let's cut the bullshit. Recently, a colleague of mine teased me about my desk and office being so organized. He joked that I must not have much to do, but then ended up asking me how I honed my organizational skills. Like an Academy Awards acceptance speech, I started off crediting my mom. (laughs) She's always been incredibly organized and taught my brother and me to be so as well. I was also fortunate to be mentored by some organizational gurus and to work with some top-notch administrative assistants over the years. I'm sure there are many fancy systems for organizing things, but here's one thing I learned from mom and others. A piece of paper and now an email should only be touched once through one of the following actions. Number one, act on it immediately. If something can be done quickly, and I define that as in less than 15 minutes, and you're not working on an immediate deadline, urgent project, act on the task immediately and complete it. Then it's done and off of your to-do list. Number two, if the item needs acted on within the next week and you can't work on it immediately or it takes longer than 15 minutes, place it in your to-do file or your to-do folder on your computer. This file and folder will usually have multiple items in it and should be kept nearby your primary work area and obviously on your phone and computer. The to-do file and folder must be reviewed multiple times every day to make sure you're on top of your main priority items. Number three of the six, if a task requires action within two weeks and you don't want to forget about it, place it in your tickle file and your tickle folder on your computer. Don't ask me how that name came about. I think it's a 70s thing, but uh, the tickle file or folder should be reviewed two or three times each week just so you keep it fresh and top of mind and help prepare for that item. And items should have a due date so you know to prepare for the actual deadline. Number four, delegate or forward the item to someone. Remember to provide specific timelines and action items for the person who's been assigned the responsibility. If you're delegating something, be fair to the person you're delegating it to. Number five, if it's something important but not actionable, File it as soon as possible. If you can't file things quickly, at least file multiple items once a week. So you're filing the paper items and you're filing those emails. Number six, my personal favorite, discard or delete. You need to get rid of some emails and throw certain pieces of paper away if they're not relevant now or won't be within the next six months. Enjoy discarding and deleting. It should be a liberating experience. You can fight through the morass of emails and papers that come across your desk. The key is to touch the piece of paper or email once and then have a plan for it. And remember, thank mom for all those things she's taught you over the years. Our guest today is Chris Rodell, the author of four books, including Use All the Crayons, The Colorful Guide to Simple Human Happiness, and his latest, The Last Baby Boomer. Chris is a freelance writer and blogger, author, motivational humorist. He has wrestled alligators, skydived, eaten like Elvis, and laying on a bed of nails. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm guessing your bio has some stories tied to each item, so tell me about wrestling alligators. Uh, I did a lot of stories. I I started out as a newspaper reporter, and I got tired of covering like school board meetings and things like that. And I had an opportunity to go to the National Enquirer and do a thousand swashbuckling stories like that, like wrestle alligators, and they would put you in dangerous situations to see how things would work out. You have all of your appendages, so it worked out with the alligators? Yeah, I beat that alligator's ass. Nice. Now that (laughs) is definitely not... What about uh, laying on a bed of nails? That's the only bullshit story I ever did for the National Enquirer because it said, Enquirer reporter lays on bed of nails and feels no pain. Now, they had me go out there to demonstrate the power of the mind over pain. I laid on a bed of nails. They put 50 pounds of concrete on my chest and cracked it with a sledgehammer. And I was mostly terrified, but not, not for the ordeal, but I was terrified the photographer would screw up and I'd have to do it all over again. It did hurt, though. It hurt like hell, of course. And I said to the editor, it said, Inquire reporter lays on bed of nails and feels no pain. I said, why did you write that? It was untrue. He said, well, it was a victimless crime. 
And he said, if we'd have put inquiry reporter Lee's on bed of nails and feels terrible pain, everybody would have said, of course, that's not news. Eaten like Elvis. That was a good one. Blueberry donuts, what? Everything, anything you can mention. There was a, there was a show on, uh, I think it was on HBO, it had Elvis's cooks. And had these kind old women that were there and they said they'd cooked for Elvis and they said, I remember taking him these sandwiches and he'd be sa sitting in bed there and butter would just be dripping down his elbows. He said, bring me six more of these. And I thought, what would happen to a normal human being if they ate like Elvis? So I got the Elvis Presley cookbook, Are You Hungry Tonight? Uh, will you sing that with me? Are you hungry tonight? And so we, uh, we ate like Elvis for a week. I got, uh, we bought like $500 worth of groceries the first day. And there was so much food there that we would like give the dog little scraps. The dog, a golden retriever that was like starved the whole time, ate so much he ran and hid behind the furnace down in the basement. He was so sick of food. So you did this before Spurlock's supersize. I, I did. I did predate that. I should have seized on his idea for that. But uh, I remember I called the editor up after two days and I said I'd gained four pounds. I was really proud. He said, that's not enough. These pictures got to make you look huge. And so I just started gorging all the time. I was either gorging, washing dishes, or cooking more food the whole time. And I gained 20 pounds in one week on the Eat Like Elvis diet. It's our guest, Chris Rodell, on the No BS Show. And we could go on and on with these unique National Enquirer stories. And I want to get back to that. But first, I want you to walk through your educational background and your career journey. And when we get to the Enquirer, you can come back with some more okay. of these cool stories. Well, I grew up in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, which is code for I went to Mount Lebanon. Because okay. nobody ever admits they went to Mount Lebanon once you've left Mount Lebanon. If I tell my friends in Latrobe are always saying they, they put me down. I've lived there for almost 25 years now and they still call me a cake eater. So do you have the Mount Lebanon tie, which we'll get into in a yeah. second. But before the show, we went over something that I've always laughed about because yeah. is it Latrobe or Latrobe? And tell us, uh, tell our audience why you know it is what it is. Well, it is Latrobe because Latrobe sounds like it's on the banks of the Seine River. It sounds very French. And if you've ever been to Latrobe, you'll realize it ain't Paris. And you also said there's a reason that you there's can an authority. It. There's an authority. Yeah, the, the greatest authority. When Arnold Palmer starts calling it Latrobe, I'll start calling it Latrobe. But Arnold Palmer says Latrobe. So if Arnold Palmer says it, by God, it is Latrobe. They call you a cake eater, <laughs> being from Mount Lebanon. I you're, punch them when they say that, too. Yeah, you're in Mount Lebanon, uh, Mount Lebanon High School. Yeah. Talk about that experience. Well, I, I played a lot of hooky. Okay. And uh, I was... Was Minio's there when you were in high Minio's school? Minio's was there. Did you yeah. walk I used there to work for lunch? At the, no, I used to work at the Pub and Pizza. Do you know the Pub and Pizza down on Castle Shannon uh -huh. Boulevard? I yes. used to work there. So I made pizzas. I was in the window spinning the, ta the, the dough like uh, the pizza guy. Mm -hmm. I can still do that, too. You walk to school. Walk to school. Uphill, both ways. And there you go. And gosh darn it, we <laughs> liked it. <laughs> but I had a great childhood. I really enjoyed growing up in Mount Lebanon. We were on uh, Sunset Hills by Castle Shannon. I always tell people we were just a five iron from Castle Shannon, so we weren't too, uh, too precious. Mm -hmm. But I, I loved growing up there. I loved the South Hills very much and uh, got a lot of friends there and still go back there. My mother still lives there in the uh, Virginia Mansion apartments above Benihana. Okay. What took you to La Trobe? I started working at the newspaper out there. I worked at the Tribune Review, and uh, then I met my wife, and we got married, and we found a nice little place in, in Youngstown, which is just about a mile outside of La Trobe. It's down the street from La Trobe Country Club. Okay. And I, I love that there, too. We're really happy there. We've, we've got two little girls, and uh, we just love it out there. Live up in a house in the woods, and it's very satisfying. After Mount Lebanon High School, what Ohio happens? Ohio University. Ooh. Yeah. Journalism school. Journalism school. But I, I didn't go there for the journalism school. I went there because at the time, the drinking age was 18 in Ohio. And I said, that seems like the place for me. So I did. And uh, we had a great time at Ohio University. It was a it was a blast. I'm picturing the direct marketing from the colleges. <laughs> drinking age is 18. Come well, they to have Ohio. the T-shirts that says uh, a fountain of knowledge where I go to drink. Ohio University. What was your major? Journalism. So you did go to the premier I journalism did. school. I did. It really carried around the country, too, because I remember anywhere I'd go, I was down in Nashville where I ended up getting the job. And I said, he goes, where'd you go to school? And I said, Ohio University. He goes, oh, Woody Hayes, which famously was Ohio State. Yes. So it didn't really carry that far out of there. And the, the editor at the uh, paper, he, he talked in like a southern accent I could barely understand. He said, he goes, how long were you on the school paper? I said, one year. He goes, what'd you do the other three years? Drink beer? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, good. I did it for four. He hired me on the spot. 
So beer has a lot to do with the pattern here uh, in, in your store. It's even more because right now I was telling Suzanne earlier that my office is above three bars in Youngstown. It's at the Tin Lizzie, mm -hmm. and it's one of those old 200-year-old hotels that's in every town. And uh, it's the Tin Lizzie has, has three distinct bars, and my office is the entire third floor of the building. So I have to walk through all those spirits. I get there at 6 in the morning, I open the place up, and I walk past all that liquor, and I never once touch it. But someday I think, one of these days, every day I walk in there, I think one of these days I'm going to start the day off with a pop like that. Just to see what happens. We, we uh, forgot our tradition. Uh-oh. Our tradition for each uh, podcast is to uh, do a shot of tequila with the guests. <laughs> I happen to have a bottle here with me. Good. And a, and a, and a lime. <laughs> we, we go limeless. We go limeless. <laughs> you might have to text Mike Gaddy to have him bring it over. Yeah. Ohio University journalism major. Yeah. First job out of there is? The uh, Nashville Banner down in Nashville, Tennessee. Had some great times there. I've been very lucky my whole life with friendships and situations. Uh, Nashville was a great time. I lived there three years, but I got tired of Nashville because I couldn't find a place that knew how to make a decent pizza. So I moved back up north. But I love Nashville. It's a great town. And it's, it's what was your first job at, in Nashville? General assignment reporter. I covered everything from shootings to uh, presidential press conferences. I had great experience. Which presidential press conference? I was at a presidential press conference with Gerald Ford and uh, Jimmy Carter. And I remember I asked a really great question. They were taking their turns answering the questions. And uh, Carter was about to answer, and I said, I go, where did your presidency fail where others have succeeded, and how often does President Reagan call you for, for advice? Now, everybody knew Reagan would never call Carter for the keys to the White House if he needed them. Exactly. And Ford jumped right in. He stepped all over Carter. He said, he goes, I'll let history be the judge if my presidency was a failure or not. And I hear from President Reagan all the time, and Carter the whole time is waiting like, please, I want to answer, I want to answer. And then he said, that's it, everybody, thank you for coming. What do you think Carter's answer might have been? I think he'd have said, uh, I think he'd have taken a shot at Reagan at the time. You know, and, uh, and Ford at the time was uh, still kind of a nothing in history. And Carter had a historic presidency in the, in the realm that it was considered a failure. Yes. So it would have been very interesting to hear his answer. He's the only elected president that ran for a second term and lost since like... 1909 is that right yeah i'm pretty sure just that's, go through that's it. interesting just go, just go through yeah. it yeah just go yeah. through it nixon won his second one yeah. ford wasn't elected johnson uh, back one out. Of the other bush so i guess i'm wrong already so bush and carter yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so but i mean if you go back from ninth from woodrow wilson you hit yeah. wilson and then uh let's see um Harding died in office. Coolidge took over, and then I can't remember what happened there. Hoover lost. Yeah. Then you have a string of 28 years of FDR. You know? Right. Then yeah. you have eight years of, of Truman. six years of Truman, eight years of Eisenhower. Yeah. Kennedy was shot. Johnson didn't run. Nixon won re-election, got yeah. impeached. Ford didn't trivia. get elected. Yeah. Ford didn't get elected. Carter lost. Brandon Reagan lost. won two. Clinton won two. Obama won two. W one two and W's dad lost, so yeah. it's Carter and the original. Interesting George Bush. trivia. I'm a, I'm a I'm a weird president. I like guy. presidential trivia. I've been just reading the uh, Robert Caro books on LBJ. Amazing presidency. Yes. What a what a psychotic man too. A psychotic man would be taking a crap and have people. Yeah. Like Bobby Kennedy had to talk to him while yeah, he was taking how humiliating. a shit. Yeah. Yeah. And then David they followed Smith, that David presidency Smith, our audio up with guy's Nixon beep too. Out that I said said that. <laughs> he's, he's, he always tells me to stay above the fray, and I said that word. He he pooped and had <laughs> JFK Robert Kennedy have to work with him. Tell me more about that book because there's some interesting stuff. First of all, he passed more legislation than most people. The Carroll books, and because he because LBJ was amazing on the Senate. Oh, he's incredible. He's very floor. gifted to politician. Yes. Uh, I like the Robert Caro books. There, there are four books, and he's completing the fifth uh, one now, fifth volume. And most of them are like 700 pages long. They can go 200 pages without even mentioning LBJ. So it's a great history of Texas and America, too. How he stole that election. 68 votes, I think it was. They found, they found the rolls of the uh, votes that had voted for him. And not only were there 68 votes that they hadn't seen before, but they had voted in alphabetical order. <laughs> that's true that's true when they found the list it was in alphabetical order <laughs> so all those people in that county in texas showed up 
alphabetically and voted for LBJ. Yes. <laughs> there, there's some great stories about him. how did history change because of that? Great stories about him. I, yeah. I love the presidency because I and do too. It's, it's, you can say this right now, all, all of them amazing men. Soon, hopefully, if not this term, the next time we're talking about that, we, we definitely get a, a woman yeah. and multiple women. Yeah. But to date, it's men. But even the ones that we say are failures are just absolutely amazing Oh my stories. gosh, you could spend all that time d digging into them. And I, I've started reading a lot about Churchill now too, the Manchester books about Churchill. And my favorite quote, and there's so many of them, my favorite quote from Churchill is, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah. It could have been improved upon though. When you're going through hell, go faster. It's the No BS Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich, with Chris Rodell, already an amazing guest, an author, motivational humorist, multiple books. His latest I'm holding is The Last Baby Moon. We're going to talk about that. But right now we have to ask you, give us your example of when you've seen bullshit in the workplace. And having worked at the National Enquirer, I'm kind of hoping that's where it comes from. <laughs> Uh, the Enquirer was the best job, uh, the best group of people I ever worked for. And I've, I've worked for magazines. I've worked for Esquire, Sports Illustrated, Playboy, and all them. But uh, the Enquirer were the ones that got into it just to tell great stories. So many other people get into the business for other motivations. They used to get together and sit around and talk about stories. After, after, after work, they all went to the same bar. All the tabloid people in Boca Raton area went to the same bar, and they were, most of them were British. And you just heard pure stories. It was wonderful. Now, uh, I saw so much more bullshit working at small newspapers because I, they just have, and, and the newspaper industry is in such a mess right now. I remember the one time that I had to go cover a meeting and I said, but nobody goes to these meetings. There's no reader that's going to read it. The only people who read it are the people who were there. And the only reason they're going to read it is to see if I made a mistake while I was there. And they said, well, let's just go anyway. And that, that drove me out of that end of the business because I was covering too many municipal authority meetings. I remember the reason I quit was in 1982, I believe it was. Yeah, it was 82. The Penguins were in their first playoff games, the first Stanley Cup. And uh, I was covering the Yawk School Board. And they met for like eight hours in executive session, which means I was sitting there missing the hockey game the you whole time. You mean 92 though, right? 92, yeah, yes. yeah. And I was, I was missing the hockey game the whole time. So it's driving me crazy. They came out at one o'clock and they said, okay, we've made our decision and that's, we're going to meet on Thursday again at seven 30. And now Thursday was game two. So I went in before I wrote the story, I, I typed up my resignation letter. I said, I'm not going to let this dictate my life again. I, I haven't had a regular job since. I, I do that. That's a great example of BS. And I do have to be fair to you because I jumped from Ohio university to the Nashville paper and there's a number in between of yeah. the Enquirer. So talk about some of the other small pubs and then how you land the National Enquirer job. Well, I, it started at the Nashville Banner, actually, because I had a friend there who did a lot of celebrity stories for them, like because it was the country music. And so he would send clips to them. And I quit cold down there because I wanted to get back to Pittsburgh. I really love Pittsburgh. And so I had like about a six-month gap between the Nashville Banner and the job I got here at the Tribune Review. And uh, my buddy said, while I was out of work, he said, he called up the Enquirer and said, there's a good reporter who's looking for work. And they flew me down to, Na to Florida, and I spent two weeks working with them. And I just thought it was going to be a fun lark, something I'd remember. And uh, then I got the job at the Tribune Review. And about six months after that, the Enquirer called and said, will you do a story on America's cheapest hamburger, which is in Peachins in Dunbar near Fayette County? And I said, how much does it pay? They said, $750. I said, how long will it take? They said, it'll take you about an hour. So I started doing that. I started freelancing for the Inquirer. And the Tribune Review knew about it? And yeah, didn't I care? did check with them first, which was kind of foolish. I should have done it on the sly in case they'd have ripped that away from me. Could have just used like a, a different name. What what name would you propose? Rock, know. Rock, uh, Rock Johnson or... <laughs> Yeah. There you I go. gotta think Rock of one, Johnson. <laughs> Not Chris Rock, though. Yeah, that was already taken. <laughs> so I did work at the Tribune Review for about three years. I, I made a lot of good friends there and met my wife there, and uh, I quit. And I, I knew I could land at the Enquirer and start doing that stuff, which was a lot of people said, if you want to be taken seriously, that's not a good move. And I thought, why would I want to be taken seriously? First of all, second of all. It's so much fun telling these great stories. They're truly swashbuckling stories, the ones we talked about. Uh, what, a, what an experience that is to spend 10 years doing that kind of thing. And it paid good money, too. There were many days when I would make $1,000 before lunch, 
and uh, just then go golf and enjoy the day. So it was a great move. Now, I've read the Inquirer's headlines. I've read it while standing in line at the yeah. supermarket. I've bought it a few times uh, as a lark, if you will. I cannot even remember. Are there bylines in the National? Oh, yeah. There, there used to be. I don't think there are now, for, for example. I'm, I'm not sure, but... Uh, I, I would have, if I didn't have four in a week, my, my friends would say, well, I guess you took the week off, you know, but I would have as many as four. I was one of the top writers there. They had, I remember the fax machine they had there. It had like a hundred numbers on the auto thing. And uh, it had number one was the people who were representing Bill Clinton during the impeachment trials. They were also the libel lawyers for the Inquirer at the time. Number two was some big Hollywood agent. I was number three on the fax machine at the National Enquirer. Mm. How about that? That and the surname Rock Johnson are <laughs> going to leave our listeners in awe of you. <laughs> Tribune Review, yeah. how long? About three years. I quit in 92. Okay. I, you, you quit with the Penguins. Yeah. What happens after you quit? You just go full-time Inquirer? I was doing full-time Inquirer, but at that time I was thinking I do want to keep my hand in traditional news. You know, I wanted to write for the great magazines at some point and, uh, some of them did slam the door in my face, but then at the time, Maxim was a huge magazine. They were just enormous, and I sent them my, my clips, and I had at the time three great clips. I called them my greatest cl hits clips. The one was uh, creative, and I had to uh, dress like, uh, it was when Braveheart was out. I had to wear a kilt around for a day in a small town to see what kind of reaction I'd get, and so I had to wear a kilt around Greensburg for a day, and... Uh, I, I say, people said, what was it like? I said, well, if you had a list of the five people you would most want to moon in Westmoreland County, I got four of them. So that was good. And then the, the second one was, uh, was the, me laying on the bed of nails. And the third one was me eating like Elvis. I, I had them labeled creative, uh, colorful, the king. And, uh, so I, I would, a lot of people would say, well, we don't want this guy. The editors at Maxim called me up and said, right away, come to New York. We want you to work with us. And so once I started doing stories for, for Maxim, and they were the same stories. You know, they were the same interesting stories. And another fact about the Inquirer is I would read 10 newspapers a day from all over the country. I got a lot of stories out of the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal has a, a little section, a little six-inch story section on B1 they used to have every, every day. And it would have stories like, in about 25 years, people will be vacationing on the moon. Now, that's a story for everybody. So I would call it up. First of all, I shortened it. I said in about 10 years, everybody will be vacationing on the moon because in 25 years, most of the inquiry readers would have expired by then. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want that. So they said, yeah, do that story. And I did that story. I called the same experts and they said, talked about moon vacation. There'll be inflatable hotels and all this interesting stuff. And then I did that story for golf magazine, travel and leisure. It's the same story you can do. I could do that today for a bunch of magazines. <laughs> would you read that story if you saw it in the wall street journal yes I'd what's, scan what's it. a moon vacation going to be like you know there'll be golf but you can hit the ball it'll go very very far but it'll also won't go the direction you're aiming sometimes <laughs> how about moon basketball would you read that story i would scan it and if you find it absurd to be in the Wall Street Journal of the Inquirer, <laughs> I would say that makes sense. Well, you'll see it in a lot of the, the, the lines have blurred so much. You know, the Inquirer used to have all that. Now it's hurt the Inquirer because they were so successful. Everybody does celebrity news. You know, Donald Trump is uh, the exemplar of that. You know, he's the celebrity presidential candidate. That's a direct result of the Inquirer coverage over the years, I think. You know, it's taken the, it's taken the culture in that direction. We're with Chris Rodell on the No BS Show. Chris, talk about a learning experience when maybe you were the BS employee, the BS writer, the tough boss, or maybe your communication wasn't what it needed to be. Looking back, when do you think you might have been guilty of some BS? I, I think I thought about that a lot, and uh, I didn't have too many experiences in that realm, but I think with me it is whenever Wait, wait, wait. Says, come on now. We had one guest push back on this, Tom Rodriguez, and we had to light him up. Now, come on. You've never been where you thought, ah, oh, I'm kind of being a BSer, and you learned from it, became a better person. And I've never been type. an employee is what I meant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been an employee for six years, so I have to go back to like my Pizza Hut days or Pub Well, pizza. you don't have to be as a BS employee. It's when you were a BSer. Well, I think I think You started me, off before we went live. You said you BS 99% of the time. <laughs> that was a lie. <laughs> Jeez. 
I think for me, it is when somebody asks me to write for them, like somebody says, will you ghost write this for me? And I used to do things like that, but my heart wasn't in it. And I would try because they'd give me a paycheck. And so anymore, like, I don't even think I could write a straight feature anymore because I've been so immersed in writing fiction and the blog right now. So for me, if somebody says, will you write my story? Now I just tell them everybody has to write their own story. You know, if it's something you like, you can't sit down. I think a lot of people think of writing as me sitting there typing while they walk behind me in a purple robe with a cigarette with a long stem holder, you know, and spouting out wisdom like that. When you ghost, when you did ghost writing, talk about that because it made you feel a little bit like a BS or t talk about, don't give any names of who you did it, but just yeah. why did they come to you? And was it like a president of a company said, write this for me? Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that's a situation. Somebody would say, we want you to write our biography or something like that, or ghost write a book about golf. Here comes Mike Gaddy with the tequila. Okay. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> we're live. Hello. Bring that. Pour some of those. <laughs> I haven't brought you a glass. Oh, wow. Look at All this. All right. Those are big glasses. Yeah, you're the moderator. <laughs> so the story here, folks, is when Suzanne b bought some tequila for the office for Christmas, we decided that we'd make a tradition with the podcast, <laughs> and the guest and the producer and the host have to do this shot of tequila to start the show. So Mike Gaddy was clutch. He brought it over. We're going to get this live. And cheers. Cheers. Let's see how this tastes. It's mezcal. Ah. <sighs> Oh, that's good. That's good stuff. That is good stuff. <laughs> that is. Oh, that'll change the complexion wow. of this podcast I want to be. I want to be on your show once a week now, all right? Because yeah. I love coming to Pittsburgh, so if I can come down here and have a shot of hooch before I go on my rounds, you know, it's great. It's beautiful. Yeah. It changes the whole demeanor of, yeah. <laughs> of the host, the producer, and the guest. <laughs> Suzanne? That's good. Now, good? The, the tradition is one shot of tequila? The guest's allowed to do as many as he I was going to say, like. let's make a new tradition. <laughs> <laughs> it is the no bs marketing show chris so we want to talk about our definition of marketing and yeah. i want to see how you think that applies to stuff you've done because i have to tell our listeners you're a heck of a marketer uh the the books the fact that you were on the inquirer how you got into the inquirer just your story is very compelling and you understand marketing and our definition is that you first clearly define your target market so you define these your dream, your aspiration was to get in these major pubs like Esquire. You defined your target markets. We talk about doing marketing intel to find out what your target markets want. When you get that intel, a lot of times you're like, oh, I don't exactly have what they want. And you kind of did that. You said, well, wait, they want this kind of story. Let me change yeah. and give them. So we find out what they want and tweak it so you can give it to them when and where they want it at a price they're willing to pay and then tell them about it again and again. My frustration with our profession is the vast majority of humans think that marketing is the telling them about it again and again, mm -hmm. when that front end stuff is hugely important. So hearing that definition of marketing, think back to throughout your career, what's your most memorable marketing or messaging success? Um, I think it might be for the Use All the Crayons book. Uh, at the time I was writing stories about Dr. Jonas Salk, great man. You know, he, he saved probably the lives of all of us with his cure for polio. And uh, I remember, it's very relevant today. He came up with this cure and they said, well, what are you gonna charge for it? He said, it's nothing, it's free. And they said, why wouldn't you charge people for it? Why wouldn't you patent it? And he said, can you patent the sun? He was saying, if you're doing something that can help humanity, you should just do it for, for God's sake, just do it to help humanity. And when I was putting the Use All the Crayons book together, I, I want it on the very first page and it's on there. It said, this book is free. Uh, for anybody who wants it. Now, I should have put some caveats for anybody who's less well-off than me, which is everybody, basically. But what I did was I, I had a book there that I thought would make people happy. And I've known people with polio who were perfectly cheerful, but I've also known people who were perfectly physically fit who were miserable bastards. So I thought if I had a book that could make people happy and could do something to improve their souls, why would I stand in the way of that? So I've, had, I've fulfilled over 500 requests for that. You know, people would say, send me a book. It's a single mother usually or a waitress or something like that. And they said, and boy, the letters I got back from that, that pay it forward type thing were wonderful. So I think that's something there that if you have something that you think is good and you believe in it to, to try and give it out there and the word gets out. And I started doing now, that's how the motivational speaking came about. I started doing, uh, speaking to like libraries and a woman there heard me speak at the Greensburg library. And she said, will you come down and speak to our students at WVU? 
So I went down there and she bought 250 books before I set foot in the door. And, I, and that really launched my career as a, as a motivational speaker. I got such great reaction. And uh, one of the things there that I think is relevant to you guys is I seized the opportunity. I knew I'd have a crowd of 250 raucous students there. And I didn't want to waste that. So my whole mind was, how was I going to use this this forum to to perpetuate what I'm trying to do? So I gave my speech and I stopped them. It was all being filmed, professionally filmed. And I had 250 kids there. And I said, I stopped them at their ovation. They gave me a nice ovation. And I said, I want you to, do, I'm filming this for promotional reasons. I want you to do, I'm going to do the last 30 seconds all over again. Only this time, I want you to go out of your minds. I said, I want you to react like you think I'm Oprah and I've promised you each a brand new car. And this is all filmed. It's on YouTube. It's everybody I watched it. it out. Oh, did you see it? And that's exactly what happened. And they went out of their minds, didn't they? They did. <laughs> it's impressive. We'll have that on the show notes. <laughs> but that's that's a thing that I, I think is marketing because I, I, I've told you I called it guerrilla marketing. The difference between gorilla marketing and guerrilla marketing is guerrilla marketing people go or guerrilla marketing people go ape shit. I love that analogy. And again, we'll put that because through the 80s and 90s, G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A marketing, guerrilla marketing yeah. was a buzzword. Yeah. And I thought it was a bit of BS. Yeah. Some of it was BS. And you come back with, well, my answer to that is gorilla, G-O-R-I-L-L-A, because people go apeshit. That, yeah. That's a pretty good analogy. Yeah. Chris, go through your bio real quick on the books and then also tell listeners how they can contact you if they'd like more information or how they can buy your stuff. Uh, you can get anything I do. It's all under the uh, chrisrodell.com website. And that also has sample chapters for The Last Baby Boomer. It has links to uh, videos of me speaking. And uh, there's also websites for Use All the Crayons. And uh, Eight Days to Amish is my blog if you're looking for free, cheap laughs. I had a friend of mine, he said, he goes, you know, everybody loves your blog so much. Put up a donation site. You'll be inundated with money. And uh, this was about a year ago. So since then, I've made $102. He gave me $100. I went onto my wife's computer and put down uh, $2 on PayPal just to see if it worked, and I had to pay her back. But I still love doing the blog, and I, I just think if you, another thing I tell people in these talks is do something you love to do every day just because it's something you love to do every day. And for me, that's writing. If I spend about two hours a day writing, even if it's about something very silly, and it always is, I try to keep it very non-political. And uh, it's just something I love to do, and people enjoy reading Eight Days to Amish, so... If you want to do that, but uh, I, I would prefer if you'd buy the books, <laughs> multiple copies. Chris, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Should we do these last shots? We got to do last shot. Ready, everybody? Here we yeah. go. Last shot to, to close out the show. This was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Sue's here we go. All right. Here's my slur speech for Thanks for joining us. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us for the No Bullshit Marketing Podcast. Visit boldsolutionsnobs.com. For show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources, sign up for Light Reading. You'll receive valuable strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light and tend to be read in two minutes or less. And it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit massolutions.biz, B-I-Z. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold.